started and folks I guess can check in as they come in so go ahead and come to order here I think at 10.03 by my clock so I know we had a, a um, updated um, sorry reading through here updated agenda that had gone out um, starting with kind of a review of some minutes. So I see we have minutes from January 21st, 28th, and February 4th meetings. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about those or discussion? I would move to approve the minutes as a uh, second. Okay, so we have a, a motion. Actually, let's let's quickly do roll call because um, I know it was hard to sort through everything. I'm, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. We had a it's, busy, busy morning. It's okay. Uh, so, yeah, Teresa, do you want to go ahead and I, roll I, call I and then we'll right. go on so, that? Okay. <laughs> so I'll start the Labor Caucus. So, of course, no, let's see. So. Matt is, Matt is excused, and Jill is here, seats in Scott, of course, and Marcy is here, and Margaret is here. And then for the management side, Patrick is here, and I, good morning, Tammy. Good morning. And I see Lynn and Sarah. So we do, yeah, we do officially have four. Okay, and then I see we had a motion and a second to approved, uh, approve the minutes for January 21st, January 28th, and February 4th. Do we have any discussion on that? Seeing no discussion. All those in favor of approving those three, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so it looks like that passes. Um, moving on next, I see we have a couple department updates. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so um, for the there's no upcoming rulemaking activities except for the public hearing um, on February 15th for the uh, medical fees and payments, medical services, and interpreter services. This is an annual uh, rule that is updated. So it's pretty standard, and this is at the, the right time of year. Um, I was also asked to provide an update on the bills that you have all considered to date and where they are at in the legislative process. So I will go through that. Um, so for House bills, um, House Bill 4086, this is the bill that um, aligns workers' compensation, some statutes with the um, Bureau of Labor Industries anti-discrimination laws, and also updates um, who are um, beneficiaries um, for death benefits. Um, so you voted this out unanimously. There was a public hearing and the bill was voted out um, without amendments from the House Business and Labor Committee and it is currently scheduled to be considered by the entire House um, for a floor vote on next Monday. It's on the calendar. It may not happen on that day, but it's, it's, that's where it's at. Um, House Bill 4113, this is the Firefighters Cancer Presumption Bill. Um, it was voted unanimously out of House Business and Labor on, the on February 9th with the amendment um, as recommended by you all. Uh, again, voted out unanimously, and it is headed um, to the House floor um, for a vote. I'm it's, it hasn't been scheduled yet. It's still in transition between the different desks and such. There. Um, shifting to Senate bills. Senate Bill 1585. This is the bill that directs um, the Oregon Health Authority um, and DCVS to go into, enter into an interagency, intergovernmental uh, agreement um, in regards to access to data from OHA um, for the ombuds um, for Oregon workers to provide notification to um, fatal families um, for those who uh, have passed away from COVID. Uh, there was an amendment, I think we mentioned it um, during the meeting in which you, you recommended unanimously. Um, there was an amendment that was adopted um, by the Senate Labor and Business Committee. It does not change what the legislative intent is. Um, what the amendment does is it sets up the, the exact type of data that the Oregon Health Authority is going to give DCBS 
it as a reporting requirement for DCBS and employment and OHA to, uh, to report in by December 15th um, in regards to implementation and any, any issues that arise from there. Um, the employment department was also added because when we are, um, DCBS will be relying on their data in order to verify the workers that, that they were employed. Um, and oh, and that's, I think that's essentially what that is. Um, uh, last but certainly not least, um, the amendment sets a sunset date of, at the end of the pandemic. Um, okay, sorry, that, I, I will shut off my uh, look in a second. Um, last but not least, uh, Senate Bill 1560. This is the bill in, that updates the terminology of alien to non-citizen throughout statutes. Um, you unanim unanimously recommended those changes in, that were in sections 13 and 14 of the bill. Uh, the, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee held a, work, a public hearing this week on the bill. It is scheduled to be voted out on Monday. So with that, and so you only have the one bill today, and that is it in regards to, so to date for your legislative review. And if you, it is, I'm, saying, I'm open to questions, too, before we go on to the next topic. Hi, Sarah. Hi. No question. I would just like to take a moment and celebrate all of our successes as uh, MLAC. So thank you, everybody. Give ourselves a pat on the back there. <laughs> I agree. I think that's great. I think we've, we've come through and, and been able to accomplish a lot here in, in the short session. And I know the trial by fire for those of us less experienced and also the brand new members has, has been uh, something that it's impressive we've been able to, to strive through and, and really achieve things. So I agree. So any other questions or, or comments about the update? Okay. So moving on, I know we have uh, some time slated for our legislative review of uh, HB 4138. Uh, it's my understanding that we wanted to hear kind of an update, that there was some, some good progress that had been made by stakeholders. Um, and, and I know maybe a, a kind of update from, I believe it was, I think, SAFE and OATLA had, had been making some substantial headway here and maybe had an update for us. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, this is Giovanna Patrick for OATLA. Um, we have agreed in principle to language that I believe was submitted about an hour ago or so. We've been hard at work this week on um, amendments. And so we have the amendments that we've submitted uh, for your consideration that all the stakeholders agree on, and SAFE and, and OATLA agrees on. And you know, part of those discussions as well, it's not in the amendments that we put forth today, but part of those discussions as well, is our willingness to continue to engage in discussions about access to and engagement with uh, workers' uh, treatment. So that's certainly still part of the discussions and we're feeling very confident that uh, we've gotten to where we have gotten here today uh, on something that can be voted on. Thank you. Hi, this is Elaine Schooler with Safe Corporation. I just want to echo what Giovanna said. Um, you know, this has been a long process, a lot of discussions for quite some time, and uh, we're happy to offer this amended language. Um, both sides worked really hard this week to find consensus and made concessions and made last minute tweaks um, that made this workable for, for both of our groups. So we appreciate um, all the flexibility um, members have shown and patience on behalf of MLAC while we work through this really challenging process. And we're um, you know, optimistic that as these discussions continue and um, we move on to addressing you know, worker access and continued engagement with their medical providers, we can find a uh, similar common ground. Um, so I'm, I'm here to answer any questions the members may have about um, what we're proposing. Um, otherwise, I think, you know, kudos to, to everybody here. It's been a lot of hard work and um, a good outcome. 
Thank you so much. I think that's really helpful um, update from both sides and sees, seems like there's some good consensus here. Um, I see a question from Sarah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Scott. Elaine, just a quick question of, and uh, Giovanna as well is what do you um, anticipate it looking like going forward the discussions on the worker access to medical providers? Yeah, I think, thanks, Sarah. I think it's um, a continuation of um, what we've been talking about of workers maintaining that regular contact with their provider, not falling through the cracks, ensuring that they're having that connection to their medical care throughout the, their uh, recovery so that um, they're being treated appropriately, receiving appropriate work restrictions, and, and ultimately recovering and, and hopefully getting back to work because that's, uh, you know, the central goal of the system is to help workers through that recovery and, and get them back to the workforce. Yes, I'll just echo what Elaine stated. I mean, we've been working together for years talking about different issues. This is certainly an issue that's that's still being discussed. And, you know, for our part, we too want workers to be engaged in their medical treatment and to be able to access their doctors and to get better and get back to work. So we all have the same goals. And yeah, we certainly uh, plan on continuing these discussions. I will just say that, you know, at least for us, at least for Keith and I, we would probably want a little bit of a break because it's been quite a bit of a push for us. But, you know, we're, we're continuing. We plan to continue to engage. Yes. Thank you. We have another question. Any other questions from folks? Margaret, did you have a question? I did. I was, since we just got the um, language very, um, not very long ago, and since there are so many people here today, I'm wondering if Giovanna and Elaine could give us a brief summary of the agreements that have been made so far. Um, sure. I, I can go first, I guess, um, since I was quick to unmute. <laughs> Giovanna, jump in if I miss misspeak here. Um, so we have, I think, uh, let's see, one, two, three, about four sort of pieces to this. Um, the first is extending the time period for a retroactive authorization. Um, this uh, amended language has a 45-day period for workers um, uh, attending physicians to go back and, and authorize those retroactive time loss benefits um, when they weren't previously addressed. And then also carves out an exception when uh, there are certain types of denials or uh, treatment um, disputes that impede a worker's ability to get those releases. So for example, a worker files a claim and the whole claim is denied um, and the worker appeals that denial and it has to go through that appeal process and is ultimately set aside. The goal is to not um, uh, have workers miss out on needed time loss benefits under the statute and rules for a claim that was denied when they weren't obtaining those authorizations during the litigation period. So to free them up to go back to their doctor to get that release without restriction and fill in that time period. Um, same with uh, treatment disputes, for example, if there's a dispute about attending physicians and who should be, who has the authority to authorize time loss uh, benefits. We don't want the worker to be left without those benefits when that is resolved and um, they may need to go back and again fill in the gap there. Um, the next change is uh, a notice requirement and um, this one was crafted so that insurers are providing notice to workers when their time loss benefits are, are going to end or will end. Um, initially, it had a time period in it, and we removed that to give more flexibility because these um, cases and claims are, are you know, unique and the situation is different. So to give um, workers notice, um, we know we want that to happen so workers are not being surprised. At the same time, um, when an insurer does not send notice, have those time loss benefits continue until the notice is sent to the worker so they're not experiencing unanticipated gaps. Um, once the notice is provided to a worker, um, they have the opportunity then to correct deficiencies with their authorization. And um, one exception is when the notice is more than uh, 45 days after they were no longer eligible 
which means they're beyond that time period where they could go back to the doctor and get a retroactive authorization um, that the worker be given additional time, 30 days from the date the notice goes out to correct that deficiency and not again be held to that 45 day retroactive limitation that, um, that could hinder their efforts. Um, also, the notice has to state the reason that time loss is, is ending or has ended so that the worker is informed of um, the basis for the, the termination of those benefits. The third change is um, the medically stationary date, limiting the attending, uh, limiting the physician, excuse me, from going back no more than 60 days to declare a worker medically stationary. And this is to address those, in, those claims where there may be an IME um, that occurs where that uh, doctor declares a worker medically stationary and the attending physician concurs, but there's uh, six months of time loss that has been paid because of ongoing care. Uh, at times we see workers continue with physical therapy for two, three months, um, and the doctor says, you know, you, you didn't improve with this treatment. Um, you were medically stationary three months ago. This is to address that situation so workers um, are not having more um, a time loss removed when they're engaging in their care. The third change um, is, excuse me, fourth change is the overpayment limitation, and this would require insurers to declare overpayments within two years of the payment being issued. So that aligns with the two-year limitation that workers have for challenging um, inaccurate uh, time loss payments or processing errors. It puts uh, the insurer and the worker on an even footing so that they're both tied to that two-year period. And if the insurer does not give notice within two years, um, then they can't declare that uh, a time loss as an overpayment. The last piece is the effective language. We asked that it be made effective January 1st, 2024, and that's to allow insurers to implement what will be some significant processing and administrative changes to implement um, the, uh, the bill language as amended. Um, and then uh, for it also to apply to all claims regardless of date of injury. So those claims that are potentially active um, would uh, also be subject then to these changes. Yes, and then I will just add, you know, on the most recent amendment that we sent, um, we didn't, we'd already agreed on the one other provision that's not listed there, but it's in the original bill, which was that overpayments, you know, when they're claimed and properly claimed within a, a notice of closure and the worker has PPD, that the worker will still get to keep 50% of that PPD so that they have some of that final compensation to help them rebuild their lives as they were expecting. Um, I think that was the only one that you know, didn't make it on the amendment because we'd already agreed to that one. Um, so yes, I echo what, what Elaine has said. I mean, what we were, the intent here was to give workers notice and opportunity to correct, but also not create traps for workers or for insurers uh, so that, you know, time loss can be paid with everyone having notice and opportunity to correct, knowing where, the, where they are, where they stand with their doctors. And I think that can also help them engage more with their doctors when they get those notices that they need to do something to continue their benefits. Thank you. Elaine and uh, Giovanna, thank you very much. I appreciate that summary. So do we have any other questions or comments on that from folks? Hi, I'm Michelle and I'm new at this. Excuse me, but I do have one question. Now, does this also include uh, um, in-home medical workers or, or uh, uh, medical workers that, uh, uh, that travel? I'm sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, for example, um, uh, uh, medical workers that, uh, it, you know, it, this is for the compensation for them when, they are, when they're hurt on the job. Is that correct? So these changes would apply to all Oregon subject workers. 
So if um, you are a worker in Oregon and you fall under worker, its workers' compensation provisions, these changes would apply um, to all workers as long as they meet those requirements. And as far as the effective date, you know, the we chose one one twenty four because of the substantial IT that will need to be put in place and changes to processes for the insurers to get have them have time to set up the, especially the notice provisions. Um, and but we also made it applicable to all claims that are pending at that time. That way, if you have an open claim and you know there's not a final decision, those rules will apply to all those claims come one one twenty four. Thank you. I see Tammy. Hey, I'm just kind of wondering uh, um, if if the retroactive to all the claims uh, is there like a like all the claims back five years if something you know closes and reopens, these new rules will apply. But if there's litigation for for claims this year. That is ongoing. I mean, are, are is there any concerns about that? Is that going to be a can of worms, or is that just not a concern? I I really don't know, and I'm asking. Yes, I believe that this are you know the way that we have written previous legislation to apply in this way, and so it would only apply to cases that are, don't have final decisions on them. Certainly, we wouldn't be reopening cases that are completely closed and have final decisions. Oh. But if come January one one. 2024, a person does not have a final decision on their claim, on you know any aspect of their claim that is affected by this legislation, then these new rules would be applied as appropriate to where they are in their claim. Okay, thank you. That makes sense. Thank you. So not seeing any other questions right now, I'm wondering if it may be time to do a kind of quick caucus so that we can check in on things and uh, and then come back. Is it for that sounds okay? I think that's a good idea. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good idea, Scott. I know that we had some new technology possibly available to us today for our caucus rooms, and I don't know... Teresa, if you could explain how that works. Yes, so members, uh, to avoid what happened last week with the technical glitch, we're setting up, we're setting up breakout rooms um, for each meeting. So instead of using your caucus room the re via recurring meeting, we're doing it this way. So you have all been pre-assigned to your respective caucus. If uh, you would like someone from, um, from others, other people here in the virtual meeting room to be invited, please let me know. I can do that right away. and. As soon as I stop speaking, I can hit the open all rooms button and you will be going to your respective breakout room. And so how long do we want to reset? And so to... Um, uh, let's, I see, yeah, I see a couple of quick questions from Patrick and Tammy, probably about how it works technically, and then um, we can figure out the timing. <clears throat> uh, Patrick? I'll let Tammy go first. I think mine. Tammy? Oh, I was just going to ask, so we don't use the old link that we used last week. You just send us to it. I send you right, right to it, yes. Yes. Great. Easy. And, and my question is, Teresa, should we want to ask somebody to join us in a breakout room? I see that the chat function, I can send a message directly to you yes. in here. Mm -hmm. Will that work in the breakout room, too? Yes, it should. It should. It should. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or I could send you an email, right? Yeah. Just I have everything open, email. text, yeah, my phone, whatever works, yes. And I'll be so sending the laptop, so yeah, if you see, you message me, I'll see it right away. I would propose maybe about 20 minutes just to give folks time to process and catch up and make sure that there aren't any technical glitches. So we'd come back maybe just under that 1045 be in recess until then does that sound acceptable does that sound like too much too little scott yes yeah. sorry it sounds maybe like a little too much if we're ready ahead of time can we can we let you know yeah i think i'd be fine with that thank you and if you need the document that was submitted to legislative council that is in the chat as well so <clears throat> you all should have access to that okay i'm 
All righty. So we'll yeah circle back. Plan on circling back at ten forty five, but but maybe before then too, provided we can get everything going. And and Patrick, I'll maybe give you a call as well. Okay, sounds good, Scott. I'll have my my phone's right here. My my phone's right here. My my phone's right here. My technologically as can be. I want to thank Teresa and staff for putting that together and getting that all figured out. So I'm seeing it looks like we have everybody back now so we can come back from recess. And I think coming back, did we have any kind of additional discussion or a motion or anything that folks wanted to make? Uh, I'm ready to make a motion if there's no additional discussion. Sure, I think. Okay, I don't, I don't see any hands raised. So, okay, so I will move to approve um, HB 4138 with the uh, many final amendments that were submitted to us um, and agreed upon last night at, at 7 p.m. I do want to say that I'm really appreciative that the, the parties were able to finally come together and agree on all of these um, different items and that we do want the uh, continuing discussion about the workers' access to medical care and um, hopefully that can be added to our committee work plan discussion list that will be coming next. So that's yeah. my motion. Do we have a second? Second. So we have a motion and a second. Is there any final discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Great. Looks like the motion passes. Yeah, I, I, I want to thank everyone for their support and, and hard work on that. I know my phone was blowing up into the wee hours of the morning last night and, and then again this morning. So I know that there's a lot of stakeholder and, and, and MLAC member involvement in that. And, and I think that's, that's really great. That's really why we're here and, and you know, what we're, we're trying to do. So I, I thank everyone for their efforts. So I think shifting gears, um, we have a, a committee work plan discussion. I know that, that Tammy just brought up, um, an issue that she would like, um, added uh, to, to our, our kind of ongoing discussion. Um, maybe did we want to sort of review some of the, uh, items that we had previously listed on there? I know that, you know, Lynn had some, uh, kind of condensed formulation of a lot of that. Um, and, uh, and then maybe kind of discuss how we can move forward. I see Lynn's hand up. Uh, yes. Thank you, Scott. Uh, I have seen circulated uh, as recently, I think, as this week, uh, a list, a draft list of work plan mm -hmm. topics that Teresa had shared. I wonder if we can just share that screen to just be able to uh, kind of go through it and have something <laughs> concrete in front of us. I don't have it at the moment. Um, I had to close my, um, I had to close my outlet to have beeping, but I will, um, I will add that. I will open up my outlook and get that as soon as I can. I'll just give me just a minute. So I have a, a list of the punch list here. Um, I know primarily it seemed to be discussions of access. Um, worker access to care, um, sort of focusing on information and making sure that um, there weren't, you know, language barriers and, and tailoring communications to be in a language intelligible to workers. Um, possible development of, of some other materials related to that. I see Sarah's hand. Sorry, Scott, I'm willing to share my screen with the work plan I have. Um, if, if that's helpful so we can all look at, make sure we're, 
I've I've seen a couple different versions. I'm going to make sure we're working on the same version. Yes, sir. But I've that, never used yours in the one that I have. You may have more information, so. No, I mean, it, it's one that came from from you guys, but okay. if you're willing, I, I'm happy to share my screen if I have authority to do so. Okay. Well, I, mean, I can do it as well. I, 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 was, I found the document and was able to copy and paste, but um, I think in order to do that, then you get to control the room. So, <laughs> so, so I will just take I think you just give me access to share screen. Okay. I can, let's see. Okay. Here. There we go. Can you guys see that? Yeah, maybe if you zoom in a little bit, it looks a little small on my screen. It, it's showing two windows, Sarah. Yeah, is that, how about that? Is that better? Yeah, it's better. You just need to make it bigger. Okay, hold on. You can make it bigger with your own fingers. It, well, if you're on a computer, sorry, I'm on my phone. Is that better? That's much better for me. I see some nodding heads as well here. So this is what I had as what we were working off of. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm happy to take notes on this and send it to Teresa if it would be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I, I think that would be great. I, I think um, kind of this would help maybe sort of guide our discussion. So do we want... I'd maybe propose sort of just going through the list one by one and, and seeing if we have any ideas or, or concepts that we'd like to sort of add in or um, guide our discussion on that. If there's any other proposals for a way to do this, I'm more than happy to um, entertain those. Not seeing anything, so sort of beginning maybe to go through... Um, some of the topics here, so we have worker uh, workers access to information um, regarding workers' compensation. So was there anything in particular that folks thought about or would like to, to touch on or bring up for, you know, future discussions or ways that we could be guided on, on those issues? I see Lynn. Thanks, Scott. You know, recalling the conversation that the four of us had when we were kind of figuring out where management and labor had uh, connecting interests, I think what we were talking about there were, were there other formats such as video or podcast or uh, different ways that workers could be reached besides a white sheet of paper with a lot of words on it <laughs> that, that may not tell workers um, it may not meet workers where they are. So it was really, that was one of the things. I don't remember all of them probably, but I, I know that was part of it. Yeah, and I know that that was a, a big part of the discussion of sort of the form of communication as well, um, especially with um, folks that maybe struggle with, with advanced English literacy and other things like that. Um, so I see Tammy's hand too. And I believe it was you, Scott, that had the great idea about, like, you know, on the 801 form or that the worker fills out or, um, you know, one of the uh, notices given to the worker that maybe it has one of those little square scan things that you just push or you use with your phone that will take you to, like, a video um, in a couple of different languages maybe just to give the injured worker a little bit of information, just easier access because we send them so much paperwork, they don't read it, and um, I understand why, and it's sometimes difficult to understand. So that's one of the things that we had talked about is, you know, could something like that be developed? Yeah, no, I think great idea of QR code, I think, is what Sarah's put down, that little kind of scannable issue, uh, uh, printed form uh, that then links you to something on your phone. And I think I know a lot of the discussion was had as well that um, a lot, it seems like a lot of folks access to internet is through smartphones nowadays, um, especially with, with workers um, 
having access to that where they may not have access to the, the other forms of communication and getting information. Um, Lynn, I see your hand up as well. Uh, thanks. One thing that I just recalled as part of the conversation was the idea of uh, an employee worker-friendly website that would allow them to just kind of figure out where to go next in the process if they're they're at a stopping point and they're confused. And uh, the state has done that, for example, when we were doing um, COVID shot, uh, vaccination appointments. And, you know, you had to choose, do you meet these criteria? And then you went somewhere else based on it. So that kind of uh, process to help a worker navigate the system more easily. So like a flow chart, maybe even an interactive sort of yeah. web page that, that form yeah. formulates things as a flow chart would. Yeah, I mean, the interactive piece is really the, the key there. Is there, is there any date, I'm sorry, I didn't raise my hand. Is there any, um, any way to determine where there are information um, um, bottlenecks or problems, you know, like, you know, are there categories of workers that maybe are not getting the right information and, and there's data that the DCBS has? Well, you know, I heard somebody say people that don't have English as their first language, maybe we would talk, I don't, I don't really know of, of any, but, um, is there is that be something I'd be curious? Yeah, I think. Do we have? Uh, is there data collected on sort of primary language or language competency or anything as part of the claim? Teresa or Sally or maybe someone. Do we know? Uh, are you talking about? Oh, sorry, oh, no, Teresa. No, no, that's you're I think that I believe there's a box. Um, there is a box on the 801 form that asks um, what their primary language is, if English is their primary language, or what their primary language is. And so that I see, I, Sally, thumbs up from Sally. I see. So um, yeah, and, and so do we have sort of demographic data stored on that, or that broken out in terms of responses that we could maybe have access to? Scott, we'll have to check with uh, with our research folks. I'm not sure um, what all we actually capture from that, but yeah, we'll we'll find that out. And then I know maybe um, from a, a more direct worker um, contact, I, I see Jennifer Flood on here as well. Um, not to to cold call out of the blue, but. Um, is there, you know, do you have maybe some anecdotal information or, or numbers of requests for uh, translators or, or anything like that? Yeah, about um, 20, well, I would say between 21 and 24 percent of our calls in the ombudsman's office, um, we either speak in Spanish with my Spanish um, assistant ombudsman's or we use the language link and um, communicate. So as for our services in the ombudsman's office, um, uh, language barriers is overcome by those tools that we use in providing our services. Is that what you were looking for? Okay. Yeah, no, perfect. And so I think maybe, you know, we can start to get access to some of this data, you know, as Patrick brought up so that we can see, you know, is there, is there anything that we can identify as a real need or a um, an area where we're seeing maybe even an increase, especially too, if we can get some, you know, historical data on some trends or something. I know, you know, as as Oregon um, diversifies in, into a, a much, you know, more resilient and diversified workforce, that that um, we need to make sure that the services are keeping up with the needs of, of the population as well. Um, I see Patrick just took yourself off mute. And one other thing was, <clears throat> other than just access to it, maybe that the understandability of it. Like, are there, you know, people like get it, but they don't really know what to make of it, or it's too complicated for them. You know, I don't know. That would be nice to evaluate at the same time. And I guess, you know, kind of going back to the idea of 
you know, looking for what the problem or the pain points really are. If there's, I don't know, a complaint box or, I don't know, some, some means of like analyzing those that took the time to tell, say, I, I didn't have access or I didn't understand what was going on or, I don't know, it might be nice to, you know, not make up problems that we're solving, but, but actually know what problems there are. Yeah, I, I think that's a good idea and trying to get as much feedback as possible from folks. Um, it, it's been a while since I went through the process. Do we know, is, is there a sort of feedback section, maybe one of the insurers on here uh, in the complaint closing process? Is there some opportunity for some feedback there or interest in maybe developing that if it isn't currently? I'm not seeing anyone jump up. I, I see Michelle Northington's hand is up. Did you have a, a question or a comment? Um, yes, actually. Also, you might want to take into consideration of how how many pages, you know? I mean, how long is, is are the forms that we have to go through and, and, and actually read and, and to understand everything exactly what's going on because of the facts that now I know for myself that um, um, uh, especially through um, SEC, you know, .gov and all this kind of stuff. Now, they send me all kinds of forms. There's two or three or four people sending me forms and sending me all kinds of things to, to read and stuff like this. Some of them are 233 pages long. You know what I mean? And in order for one person to go through what three or four people are sending me, now that's going to take probably a week because that's like, you know, over a thousand pages that I have to go through. You know what I mean? And 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 to make it short and simple is just, it's it, it it helps. Thank you. Yeah, and I I think that the Patrick's onto a good point as well, and kind of touching on that issue of um, intelligibility as well. That that even if there is. Uh, you know, proficiency in, in English, that, that proficiency in medical English or legal English is, is oftentimes difficult to master. Um, so I think understanding that as well um, may be helpful. I, I know that, that there have been metrics used with in, uh, various intelligibility and, and complicatedness of language and, and different scoring mechanisms that have been used in government. I, I'm not up to date on whether or not those are perceived as valuable or helpful. Um, maybe I can look into that a little more and, and flesh that idea out. Um, but yeah, uh, so I think a lot of a lot of discussion about that and, and accessibility and, and understandability there. Um, we don't have any other comments about that issue. I see that the next issue is sort of up here. So the, I see Dave Berenberg taking himself off mute there. Did you have a comment on the previous issue or the, the current one? Yes, just a quick comment on the um, previous issue. It seems like the issues really need to be dealt in a um, roundup level, not really sort of in a piecemeal fashion so that, um, you know, things are consistent and that we take a look to at, you know, how many of these communications are there some we can cut out or simplify? And then to the future to look at, you know, what are the options, um, a ways out for doing electronic communication or ways that workers may choose to receive communications, I would say just might be some topics you want to take up. Yeah, I think form format, especially um, in, in the more digital age that, that people seem to prefer electronic communication or that that's more accessible, but also that that doesn't always work for everyone. So there, there may be the paper preference still for some some folks, um, or or maybe not. You know, I think that's a great that's a great question. And, and how do we pivot to a, a future oriented delivery of this information? Just the last comment is that I think you know the one thing we need to do too is um, 
take a look from the worker's perspective, you know, because often we're designing forms, you know, just from the, you know, insurer business side and, and just, you know, make sure that you know, what's understandable to people who work full time in comp is not necessarily uh, resonate with others. No, I, I, I think that is, is a great, great perspective and, and the way in which, you know, discussing the engagement of of workers in the system and, and helping them navigate it and, and recover that, that that's extraordinarily helpful to keep that perspective in mind um, as we move forward on that. I see Sally Cohen. Thank you, Scott. I'll just mention uh, for the committee as well too, one of our um, process improvement projects for our modernization program, we are biting off a small look at uh, looking at the required notice information uh, that insurers are required to send to workers. And we will be having some stake, upcoming stakeholder meetings uh, to get more input on that. And the MLAC members, you will be invited to, to participate in those as well. So look, look for those coming soon. Great, thank you. So I see sort of the next topic, ongoing intimidation of and retaliation against workers. I know that this has sort of originated uh, some around some very concerning information that was coming out um, with COVID when we were discussing, you know, COVID presumptions and, and analyzing a lot of that data. And I think a lot of the concern as well was um, what the data that we were looking at was really capturing, um, not just in terms of after a claim is filed, but also before even a claim is filed, when there's those discussions capturing that information as well, or, or our inability currently to capture that information um, and understand that it, if someone is intimidated or, or um, concerned about file, filing a claim to begin with that they don't ever enter the system so that we can then understand that there is that issue and that problem. Um, and, and I know that we were depending on a lot of uh, sort of anecdotal reports because since they weren't entering the system, we were not capturing that information at all. Um, and I know I think I had talked a little bit with um, the Oregon Ombudsman's Office for, for injured workers and um, some other folks. Was there any comments or ideas about that, that that committee members had in particular? Scott, this is Jill. Um, I think that, yeah, this is, this is a super important topic that, um, that we should, should be looking at. And yeah, I think I think it's definitely a tricky one, though, and I don't know what kind of um, education we could try to suggest or endorse, almost like as a um, as a worker uh, is starting a new job. If there's, you know, sometimes there's like mandatory information that you're needing to fill out as you're starting that new employment process. I don't know if. Um, you know, some workers' compensation, education, and, you know, uh, what intimidation looks like or is, or, you know, some sort of educational piece for the worker um, that is, you know, I hate to say the word mandatory, but, um, you know, a piece that where, you know, it's like, okay, this is information that needs to be put in front of the worker in a digestible, understandable way to just to kind of, as a, as a heads up as to, yeah, kind of, these are, these are your rights. And I know something that Lynn had mentioned with us before was kind of a worker's bill of rights, essentially in, in a digestible, understandable um, manner that maybe could be delivered to the, you know, to the worker upon the start of employment. And I know that's, you know, adding to yet, an, you know, another piece of paper in a stack that they're getting, um, upon, you know, new employment, but I don't know if we could try to capture something at the beginning there. This is Marcy. I think that, um, Jill, I agree with you 100%, but I think it's also an ongoing thing. 
I think specifically for individuals who have any type of tenure with their employer, sometimes the subtleness um, or the indirectness that comes across with whether it's intimidation, harassment, or whatever, I think people just, well, this is just the way it is here. And so I think if we're going to look at education that we don't necessarily restrict the view to just the overt, like, oh, I'm going to, you know, prevent you. It's more of the guilting people and or the are you sure you have to. So that's what I've been experiencing uh, a lot. I think people are clear about their rights when it's smacking you in the face, but it's that uh, intuition or hunch that I think something's not aligning. Yeah, and I, I think that's a good idea, of the, the distinction between the sort of formal education and the practice as well, uh, and the culture. Um, I, I see Tammy's hand. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. All right. Um, uh, hi, I just wanted to comment about this. Um, Joe, I, I agree with everything that you said. And, you know, we heard, have heard this issue many, many times. Um, throughout my uh, tenure on MLAC. And the state of Oregon has um, a method of replying and investigating and fining <laughs> um, employers that use um, you know, the, these illegal uh, activities of intimidation or discrimination. And it seems like you know, we've, they will go out and they will also you know, educate employers. There's all kinds of education, but where the, the disconnect seems to maybe be coming from is that not all of them are reported to the state of Oregon. So how, how do we get you know, more education of employers or more of that reporting to the state of Oregon so the state of Oregon can go out, can go out and do their thing? Because I think they, they, they take care of it. When it's reported to them, they take care of it very well. But how do we get it? How do we get more and more people to come forward and step up and, and report it to the state, the DCBS? That's all. Yeah, I think kind of there's a lot of employer outreach. It seems like you've mentioned that maybe there needs to be worker outreach as well and, and kind of getting back to... to Dave Bar uh, Barenberg's comment on, you know, from the worker perspective, how can we make that link and, and get that con uh, contact as well? I, I think it's a great point. Um, I see Jennifer Flood with a hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to toss out there um, part of our expanded role in the Ombuds office now is workplace safety and health. And uh, one of the big issues on that end of it is the retaliations for raising um, safety issues, with, which in my mind dovetails with the retaliation for um, filing or reporting accidents. So I, I do believe that there's going to be um, work being done. And I think that it can probably dovetail together with the retaliation for filing a claim along with retaliations for um, reporting workplace safety or, or raising workplace safety concerns. So, and that's, that would involve WCD, Oregon OSHA, Bureau of Labor, um, a variety of agencies that hopefully we can all come together and work on improving um, the uh, knowledge of their rights as well as responsibilities regarding workplace safety. Thanks. And I see Teresa's hand. I just wanted to point out um, Jody Phillips Polish's uh, comment in the chat um, to add to the conversation, um, which is in the, in the fact that uh, many of um, the workers that she's come across didn't even know about the form, didn't know how to file a form, and the employer didn't provide, even just letting them know they could file a claim. So, to add, so her suggestion is adding uh, a bullet um, to what employers are required to provide to workers. I think that's a great point. And I think maybe when, too, when these things are provided, is it sort of, you know, a, a, a few pages thrown in the new hire paperwork? Is it a, a, a mandatory posting um, uh, or more mandatory postings in the break room um, for workers that, that maybe are, are more um, out and about or, or, or traveling? I know in the construction industry, there's a lot of folks that are constantly traveling. There may not be a break room. You know, the break room may be 
turning a piece of equipment off or tech, stepping to the side for a few minutes, um, how, how there is outreach to them to make sure that they're informed of and aware of their, their rights and, and, um, you know, what, what they're, what is available to protect them, um, in those scenarios. Um, yeah, I think that's a great point. I see a, a hand from uh, Michelle Northington. Yes, also because of the facts that we live in the state of Oregon and what is, you know, when our, our number one thing around here is the homeless. Now, <clears throat> why I'm saying this is because of the facts that of COVID-19, the homelessness, and over 800 medical care workers alone through Legacy has been laid off um, for one reason or another, or for not taking the uh, mandates, you know, not doing mandates, taking vaccines or whatever. Well, now uh, they have in-home care workers, okay, and, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, ongoing intimidation and retaliation against workers through care, for in-home care workers. Well, geez, you know, all they... All these people do is just, you know, get, excuse my French, get pissed off and, 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 and kick these people out on the streets. You know, so what, what, what can we do to protect these in-home care, care workers for retaliation against, you know, uh, against the people that they're working for? Yeah, and I think that kind of gets to the point of uh, the method of, uh, communication, you know, is is it a paper copy or a form that's going to work, or or internet posting, or or how is it that this information is going to be communicated in a way that that folks are able to understand that, and then and then also use it, you know, as well. Um, so, <clears throat> I think any other discussion on that from committee members? So I see uh, sort of the next topic of use the experience and discussions of MLAC during COVID uh, to continue address systemic concerns and prepare for future pandemics. And I see Lynn ready to go on that one. I was just going to say, I didn't have any specific ideas about how we should go about that, but it seemed like, you know, we were in this situation, we were flying blind and it would be, I think it would be useful to go back and look at what MLAC, what was MLAC's role versus OSHA's, which, you know, we kind of got in the middle of and had to figure that out. And then, you know, how, how do you address this? What did we do and did it work? And what didn't work in trying to make this situation better? We're going to have another pandemic, so we might as well uh, use the past to make the future better for whomever is dealing with it then. I think that's a good point. And I, I think that that's a really good um, way of phrasing it is, is sort of an analysis of what worked and what didn't. Um, and I think, I, I feel like we've done a, a bit of that or begun that work, or, or you know, maybe we're taking credit for what uh, DCBS has done in that work and sort of putting together the handbook and doing the trainings for the new members and other things like that, that we can kind of build on that and continue um, possibly moving forward. Any other members have comments on that one? So I... You know, I I, I had one yeah. comment on that one is that I, I, um, I, I read it uh, a couple of different ways of use the experiences discussions of MLAC during COVID to address systemic concerns. Is it about COVID? Is it about the functioning of MLAC? Is it about workplace safety? You know, it could be a lot of different things. And, and you know, since I wasn't on the committee during those COVID discussions, I don't, I don't really, I was kind of waiting. You know, I wasn't sure if there was some lessons learned from, you know, that time, you know, just among our own discussions. And I wasn't sure about that. Yeah, I see Lynn's hand. 
uh, just to answer Patrick's question, personally, I wasn't thinking so much about the functioning of MLAC uh, in terms of where we ultimately ended up uh, in decisions that we made, well, some of the decisions that we made, but just, you know, what were the sticking points? You know, I remember that we had to, how were claims processed? Was the claims processing function uh, impeding decisions about uh, coverage? It was those kinds of issues that it would be good to go back and say, you know, we, as we go forward, these are the things that we might want to think about. And I see Tammy. Yeah, I wasn't really going to talk about this. I still kind of have PTSD over it all. Um, it, it, we've never been through a pandemic before. And so bully issues came in, OSHA issues came in. You know, the governor really wanted us to look at this. There was so much emotion, and we were trying to look at all of the statistics. And it it took a long time to kind of figure it all out and, and, get, and get there. And... Um, there's been a lot of criticism over the final decision that uh, was made. But the fact that we had never had a pandemic and so all of these labor issues and pandemic issues and then state um, state issues with you know unemployment and you know wages, all of these things kind of came into our discussion and this is the first time we really had to talk about all of those things that were not related to MWAC that were not under our jurisdiction. So I think what Lynn and I were kind of trying to think of is, you know, is there a lesson to learn with all of that and, and something just to kind of focus MWAC, you know, if and when another pandemic comes. So n nobody else has to go through all of that other stuff. We can just focus right in on the issue. I don't know. That's just kind of what I was thinking when we um, had talked about this what lesson learned um, for next time. Yeah, I think that would be, that would be helpful. Um, any kind of proposed ideas? I mean, would we want to do that through uh, a subcommittee or some jotting down of notes or any, any suggestions on kind of how to start that or how what that would look like? Me? Are you asking that question of me or Lynn or uh, anybody? Yeah, I mean, anyone, but I think you and Lynn, you know, in, in particular seem to, to, you know, us from the old guard, I guess, as it were. Um, any any suggestions on on how we could maybe start that process or, or what the beginnings of that analysis would look like? Well, I would really like to kind of ask, like maybe Andrew or or even Teresa, because they developed all of those handbooks for us, all the training material. You know, is there any applicable section that we could add a sentence or two to? I guess that's where I would start is talking with them and see if it was, you know, fully addressed. And I see Lynn's hand, too. Uh, I think you're right, Scott, that a good starting place might be just to make notes and then to the extent that there is something that we can talk about and, uh, you know, make recommendations on, then a subcommittee would be appropriate. But kind of formulating the question more clearly uh, through notes is, a, I think, a good idea. Yeah, I know that the more distance we get from it, it seems like we're able to sort of reflect back more clearly on, on things. And, and I see uh, Director Stolfi's uh, hand raised as well. Thanks. I just want to add this. I think it's a great idea. And, you know, we, we've seen this as a state agency. I, I've been in state government for a while in a couple states and things like recessions. And I mean, this is the first pandemic, but there are other things that are encountered from time to time uh, that you benefit from, if nothing else, doing a, a good accounting of what we went through, what actions were taken and kind of what lessons we've learned. Uh, 
so that the next time something similar happens, uh, there's likely going to be all new people involved, uh, and it'll be a different situation, but uh, it could be good to at least know what the last group of people did in a similar situation so you start off in a little bit of a better spot. Now, whether that's part of the handbook or just or, or not, we can chat about it. You know, it might be something, you know, kind of a memo kept in a file that talks about everything that's a good resource for the next time. But it's a, it's a good idea, and I've definitely seen a couple of recessions where uh, by the third one, uh, we at least had something from the, the one before that that really helped us figure out what to do. Thanks. I, th I think that's great. Um, and I think, I, I know there's always the, uh, I, I don't know if everybody has this experience, but the, the teacher in middle school or high school that has you write a letter to yourself uh, that they hold on to it for, you know, a, a year or two or until graduation, and then they mail it so that you can have this kind of conversation with yourself temp temporally. Uh, that, that's kind of interesting. I don't know if, you know, there'd be room for a, a trade-off or something like that with, um, you know, a, a memo or, or note or, or something written from, you know, members to, to new members um, from one session to the next or, or something like that might be helpful as well. Um, a bit of a silly idea, but you know those those work sometimes. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like that that analysis. Any other committee uh, ideas? I see thumbs up from Tammy. So, any other discussion on that? Point, and we can move on to our next one. So I see sort of further review of MCO enrollment uh, with particular interest in ensuring that enrollment in an MCO does not delay a worker's treatment. Uh, so I know that this was something that I was really interested in given, given my experiences um, as an injured worker, now medically stationary worker. Um, in making sure I know that there are come along uh, provisions with MCOs, but I know that those can be complicated sometimes. Um, and that in my experience, I, I did experience a delay in care and sort of a, a jolt in, in my ability to, um, to recuperate and, and that caused uh, both a delay in convalescence, but also a, a lot of unnecessary uh, complications with um, trying to coordinate MCO enrollment and, and all of that. And I think that the, there's a, a rights discussion that folds into that as well, because I know that that was part of the complication was, um, uh, I believe it was a claims processor telling me that I, that I didn't actually have a right to object to uh, an MCO enrollment when, when I'd received paperwork that I did actually. So the, the sort of mandatory mailing that I'd received said that I had an absolute right to do that. But the conversations having with the, um, the claims processor that, that they weren't aware of that, at least initially. Um, so I, I, I think that again, dealing with the, the form of the notice and the um, education and training, and then the the way of um, you know stepping up, uh, contacted the um, Jennifer Flood's office, uh, had a, an ombudsman help me out and and work through that issue. Um, but again, you know, all of that was in English, written proficient, had legal training. My mother was a, a, a nursing home administrator for many years, so you know the. I was able to navigate that, thankfully, um, with with sort of it was complicated and difficult, but um, but I can only imagine for someone without those advantages um, that it would be a sort of insurmountable burden. Um, so I think kind of any other discussion points on that? Or maybe just some some curiosity. I see some some folks interested in that. I, I see a, a hand raised from uh, Ann Klein. Yes, good morning. Ann Klein, president of MDRS Health Systems, one of the four MCOs certified in the state of Oregon. And I just wanted to um, volunteer our, our services where we can help support um, educating on the MCO 
processes as well as the history um, and their purpose and intent, as well as I think what's really important in any of um, MLAC's assessment and decision making is ensuring that you have access to data in addition to the really compelling, Majoris in particular is, is very much in support of providing whatever data we can to help support you in that process. Great, thank you. Any other comments or ideas about that topic from folks? So I see moving on, uh, sort of a pin from uh, 2022 session, some, some lingering things that uh, folks would like brought up. I, I know here's where we would probably uh, talk about some of the management stakeholder concerns about time loss. Any specific comments on this? Or I, I see Tammy. Uh, is Dave or um, Elaine still here? I'm wondering if they don't, if one of those two would mind speaking about this right now. Elaine? Well, uh, hi. Um, you have me for the moment. Um, we, you know, this was the issue that um, was the idea of started with doctors having the ability to have open-ended time loss, not a date, and sometimes in the system, workers lose their connection to their health care and sometimes get lost. You know, I think, you know, as we've talked to the trial attorneys, too, um, you know, there's sort of a broader issue that might have uh, many different um, remedies. And so I think... Um, on our part, I think we were happy to come up with somewhat of a, a problem statement and, and try to define the issues and, um, you know, work with MLAC, work with the trial lawyers to see if, you know, they're in agreement with that and, and you know, try to focus on um, an outcome that we all support, which is um, trying to um, aid workers' recovery and that, uh, you know, just making sure people don't get lost in the system. Um, so that's that's what we would um, hope that could be accomplished in that, and that there might be a whole multiplicity of ideas on um, how to you know achieve that from uh, you know some on the doctor side uh, of how uh, uh, some on just even on forms, some on uh, education, um, you know, you know the, the open and time loss issue too clearly is is a solution. But I think working together we can. Um, come up with some creative approaches that will um, help improve the system. Great. I see Patrick taking himself off mute. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Thanks, Scott. You know, you and I, Scott, emailed um, last week or a couple of weeks ago when we first started talking about House Bill 4138, and I, I had put in that email something, and I think you shared it with your caucus, and I just thought maybe this is a, a good way to add something to a work plan, uh, and I'll just read what I wrote to you in, in, in the email is, um, concerns remain about deficiencies in the system of ensuring timely and ongoing connections to medical care. Um, we request that uh, MLAC support forming a subcommittee to look at the issue, discuss improvements, and make recommendations for those that are appropriate. So, sounds like a work, work plan item. So I would offer that just for the, the discussion. Yeah, I think that, that's helpful, kind of a... a um, framing the idea of making sure that, that workers are keeping up with all of the changes that we're seeing with COVID and delays and, and digital, you know, telemedicine meetings and other things like that, um, and, and making sure that the medical care keeps up with that as well. Um, 
and that they're they're not lost in that process either through you know language or communication barriers or um, the way in which the Im- information is communicated um, or the way in which they're they're having meetings and connections with their their medical providers and their insurers and all of that as well um, I know um, you know, some some folks do better on on phone or on video or or through uh, written communication and, and making sure that the form through which things are communicated would be helpful to, to analyze too. I think maybe even you'd, like you've suggested a subcommittee sort of examining this um, this topic would be would be helpful. Scott, this is Marcy. Have and I just don't know. Do you ever? look at, I mean, we say subcommittee here, but like a focus group. So to actually test out these messages and the information, because sometimes when we, we are looking at it from a different angle, not the user, I mean, you've got experience, obviously. Yeah, I think, I think that's a great point of, of um, how do we get sort of real field data on this and feedback from folks? Um, I don't know if, if Teresa maybe has a, a perspective on that, if we sort of depend on information from uh, Jennifer Flood's office and, and feedback from insurers and, and other, you know, labor stakeholders and folks, or if there's a something else that we've tried in the past of a, a more kind of clinical approach to that with a focus group or something. I think what you described as far as conversations with industry, other stakeholders, yes. Um, I believe, I wasn't at DCUS at the time, but I believe there was also a listening tour as well um, around the state. To Thank you. Some of these issues. I like that. I think that'd be especially helpful to make sure that we're present in the communities that, um, that need to be listened to most, um, that may not come to meetings like this or, or be able to. So I see it. any other issues if they arise, it seems like maybe not. What What is a listening tour? I'm not familiar with that. Um, actually, I, no, I, I, should have, I should have thought this right down before going to this. It's a lot easier virtually. It's essentially kind of like a town hall in which, um, so like let's say, for example, like I'll use uh, the, the department. Like with, so the, the workers' compensation division would go at a, at a site or now that we can do hybrid meetings or virtual meetings, set up a time. We open it up for the general public to come in and talk about their views on specific topics um, as well. But on the flip side, it can also be issued, you know, a set of questions or, you know, topics that to focus on that can be given to participants in advance um, so for a more deeper conversation. But that's basically what it is. It's just, you know, a two-way conversation. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, that that sounds like an awesome way to be able to get some different perspectives from you know the source, the workers themselves. Yeah. So let's see. Twenty twenty three session preparation is what I'm seeing next. So I know that there'll be some some WCD concept. Um, coming up potentially, um, and and some notice sent out. It looks like in September, indicating that the committee is ready to start talking about concepts. So I think preparing ourselves for the the 2023 session and and all of that. I know that there'll be some some stakeholder outreach and and other things that may pop up on our agenda. Um. I think a a kind of a wait and see approach to (laughs) to a lot of that. Um, And then other items, uh, case law litigation updates. Um, We have written down that the board has suggested a number of topic areas that that MLAC could consider discussing as policy. Um, Maybe is there anything, Teresa, that you have? I see Margaret's hand, and then maybe Teresa, if there's any kind of points that you wanted to make about that. Yes, 
I was just going to say that in the past, uh, the board's managing attorney has been, and I think the board specifically, has been reluctant to uh, come forward and discuss either politically sensitive um, cases. But in the past, I know that they, the board, and the, specifically the board's managing attorney, has uh, brought to MLAC um, discussions of recent court cases that may raise for MLAC issues that they want to discuss. So I hope that we will consider um, not only uh, accepting and encouraging uh, the board's or managing attorneys or, or uh, that person's, uh, I mean, whoever the board designates, um, as but get their input but also that uh, we perhaps invite them for a discussion. Yeah, yes, Margaret, just to let you know, yes, we do do that. Um, I believe I have a recent update to send to all of you. Um, so we send that separately from the meeting materials so it doesn't get confused, but yes. And, uh, and there is, um, WC, uh, the board is always here at the meetings as, a part, as an audience and, part, and potential participant as well. Right, I, I think what I wanted to say is that I think that the board doesn't really recommend anything but advises on court decisions that involve policy that MLAC might be very uh, interested in. Any other updates or ideas on that topic? Um, so I see next uh, sort of ongoing update. It's, um, the annual workers benefit benefit fund report due early 2023. Uh, biennial permanent partial disability report uh, next one due early 2024. Um, Oregon Institute of Occupational Health Sciences annual report uh, partially funded with uh, workers compensation funds with the next report due 2022. Do we know when in 2022 that would be due? No, I do not. But we can check with the, with the Institute. So again, don't know that we need a ton of discussion on those issues. Um, uh, may I ask a quick question? Yeah, sure, um, Sarah, go ahead. Where would we put in the reviewing of the NIOSH uh, data. Would that be in ongoing updates um, or would that be a different session preparation? That's a great question. I was thinking the exact same thing. <laughs> I, I, I was thinking and I was going to say that, that NIOSH, I, I would put in with the ongoing updates because I know that that's sort of, if, if my understanding is correct, that the way that that was included in the statute is sort of something that we would need to review. Um, in amongst our ongoing updates, so I would I would put it in there. Yeah. Was that 2024? Yeah, I would leave it there for now. Um, yes, I mean there's a chance it may be later than you know later maybe 2025, but I think 2024 is a good marker. I would like yes, definitely a marker. Thank you. Great, and then um, educational sessions on topics as needed. Um, one thing that I thought might be helpful, I don't know if there is much um, DEI kind of insight and training that uh, members can go through, um, but if that would be something that we could have available, uh, I think that would maybe be helpful, uh, especially as we're starting to deal with uh, language and communication issues and, and barriers that that might be um, valuable. I know a lot of us, you know, in our positions go through that training anyway, but to have something that be put together, um, particularly from, from a, a, an injured worker perspective or a small business owner perspective, um, that that would maybe be helpful. Um, and, and something I know, you know, the, the more diverse perspective that we can get, the, the clearer a picture of, of everything that we have. Um, so a, as a possibility there, I'd like to raise that. And I see Tammy has her hand up. 
Yes, I uh, wanted to talk about the educational sessions on topics as needed. And I saw that Greg Lowell was here. Greg, I hope you are still here and able to come on camera and talk to us for a minute. Um, Greg Lowell would teach a class uh, called You've Had an Injury, Now What? to um, small employers that really don't know anything about workers' compensation. And I know I taught it once for him when he was unavailable. And um, I was going to ask him, Greg, where are you? Uh, if, if he would talk to us about that, what the forum was. I, could, I can't remember several years ago if if it was um, a state uh, from the state of Oregon, if they were the one that was conducting the educational conference and how, you know, maybe we can open that up bigger and invite, you know, all the employers. It would kind of go all the way back up to that piece that we were talking about earlier regarding um, trying to eliminate intimidation and discrimination. and. You know, even even the board members could attend if we wanted to attend, just so they can kind of see um, from an insurance company or an insurance perspective how it how it goes from start to finish, um, and then an injured worker's perspective, start to finish. I don't see him popping up here, but I see him on the list, and he's still here. Greg Lowell, where are you? Well, maybe we can talk to him about that later because I found that that was fantastic. It starts off very um, uh, basic, super, super basic, and, and builds blocks getting all the way into some of the other things. But that was just a great educational piece that I don't know if we can share to all employers in the state of Oregon and do it online or something. Uh, Teresa, I just kind of wanted to suggest that. I think that's a good idea um, and can circle back maybe with um, him as a stakeholder. Um, I see Marcy's hand. Yes, thanks. I just wanted to, um, if we're talking education, just encourage that we don't forget about mental health. Um, I think there are a lot of people who still don't recognize that, that it could fall into this category. And I have a lot of my members out right now uh, dealing with various mental health issues that they are attributing to the workplace. I know it's a tough road, but we at least need to educate people. Scott, and then one more I put on here is overview of boards, commissions, and small entities. Uh, Teresa, I know we've been dealing with this, but this is a required training and I simply cannot find it anywhere on um, that we have to do it. Yes. On, on, on work day, so I just want to flag it as something. I, I think, Sarah, just to let you know, so for those in the audience, um, there's required trainings for board and commission members to take every year, um, in which we've shifted because of the new system. It's been very clunky. So I will talk to the co-chairs. If we get to the point that I still, we, that you all still cannot get access to that, I, it's my understanding we can do alternative tr methods of training. Right. If you have a video that we can watch and just, you know, log it with you that we've done it. Um, but that is one I simply cannot find access to. We can talk about uh, training delivery and communication within MLAC as well as <laughs> within workers' compensation as well. <laughs> I think I think that's a great point, and I think that um, that meshes well with the other topics that we brought up, and sort of the review of of MLAC and what works, and and where we've been through, and and all of that. Um, I, I I think as well, dovetailing off what Marcy said, I think that's hugely important. Not just I, I mean, not to diminish in any way the the mental health impact, especially working through COVID and and the stress of all of that at work, but also. The, the ancillary kind of mental health issues that may develop, not just for the worker, but within the community or the, um, the, the worker's family when dealing with a, a workplace injury and how that may impact um, communication and that may impact um, them availing themselves of what their rights are and understanding that and being able to, to um, you know, successfully get better and, 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 and heal up. So I think that is a, a hugely important point 
Um, I see Greg's uh, hand uh, raised now. Can't hear anything though. May may still be on mute. Can you hear us, Greg? Huh. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and get this to Teresa if that works. Mm -hmm. Greg Lowell, are you there? Can you hear us? I, we cannot hear you. While we wait, there is another good comment um, in the chat from Jody Phillips Polich about um, um, her uh, interest in mental health claims and that it's an area long overdue for reform. It was a, a good comment. Thank you, Jody. Oh, I see you. Well, I, and, I, and I popped up while well, maybe, maybe Greg's still on here, but this happens to, uh, I rep, for those of you that don't know me, I represent injured workers. Uh, and I happen to sort of have developed in some sort of weird way over the years this niche in mental health claims, which are subject to a completely different set standard than any other claim in the workers' comp system. Uh, and really haven't looked at these issues or what claims we want in, what claims we want out uh, in a very long time. Uh, we did discuss a few uh, sessions ago. We have the, the first responder presumption, and we're all still kind of trying to figure out how all that all works. But we really haven't looked at the standard that applies to the majority of Oregon subject workers in a very long time. Um, so uh, certainly something I'd be happy to present to you, MLAC on, let you know um, how they currently work. I'd be happy to do that with another attorney, uh, somebody from SAFE um, that wants to, so you get it, so you see how we, how uh, both sides perceive it. There are other, of course, attorneys out there that uh, 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 that defend these cases on a, uh, on a pretty regular basis. So if that's something that MLAC is interested in looking at, I'd be more than happy to uh, put something together for the, for MLAC. So just let me know. Great, thank you. And I see, um, it seems like Greg says that he's called back on the phone now, so maybe we'll have we'll have some audio, or are you there, Greg? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, good, I see nodding of heads. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I, I think, Tammy, you had a question for me, or? Yes, I'm not sure how much you heard of our discussion. We were talking about the educational piece. And that um, seminar you would teach to employers, you know, you've had an injury now, what I said for you one time, was just fantastic. Do you still do that annually? Who do you do that for? And, you know, do is it well attended by, you know, small employers? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we've done educational conferences, uh, the WCD conference, um, you know, the self-insurers no longer uh, have a, a group, so I haven't been out talking to them. Uh, the um, workers' compensation bar annual meeting, um, and we're always happy to get out and talk. So um, outreach is, you know, really important to DCBS and WCB, so we'd be happy to participate, um, you know, talk about case law, practice and procedure, um, you know, any topic that would be of interest um, and, you know, we certainly are aware of cases that come through that have some policy implications. And if those are things you'd like to hear a little bit more about, um, you know, the, how the cases were decided um, and, you know, maybe concurring opinions by board members that address policy matters, we're happy to talk about that as well. You, I, I was mostly interested in the one educating employers, but, you know, you've had an injury now with. Um, that one kind of ties back to what we started with on this list regarding, you know, teaching employers that you cannot discriminate or retaliate against injured workers or prevent them from filing a workers' compensation claim. So I don't know in the educational piece of employers if, if that's something that we could do, like, online, where every employer in the state of Oregon would be invited and Greg teaches little class. 
because it was fantastic. It was very educational for employers. I don't know. I kind of would like to connect um, DCBS and Greg to offer that classes to all employers. I, that's just kind of what I was, what I was brainstorming uh, with all of you. <laughs> Yeah, I think it's a great idea, um, and you know some of the you know uh, way you would talk to an employer group would be might be a little different than the presentation you might give to attorneys, um, and you know that'd be that'd be really good. You know we're always looking for opportunities to connect with different groups, um, and the case law can be you know uh, anything from you know interesting and sort of broad for employers to, you know, very specific to matters of attorney fees and penalties. Um, but we'd be happy to uh, do some training and, and you know, uh, reach out to employer groups. Um, we're always looking for those opportunities. Well, that just seems like a match made in heaven to me, it, it kind of to hopefully teach employers about that retaliation and intimidation aspect. So Trace, I don't know if something like that is possible to put together, but I just wanted to, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there and just brainstorm with all of you. Okay. All right, thanks Greg, yeah. thanks for chiming in here and your willingness to teach it if they um, they contact you and set it up. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah, reach out to me anytime, be happy to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Well, I think we have some li little bit of work here cut out for our, <laughs> ourselves, some some great ideas uh, to move forward, and I think have some really productive and, and helpful, meaningful discussions on things and, and start to address some issues. And I um, wanted to take just a quick minute, too, to, to congratulate everyone here on, on the work that we've done. I, I've been very impressed the last few weeks uh, and, and happy to work with everyone, and including the stakeholders as well. Uh, on this and, and look forward to continuing to do so and, and move forward on things. Is there um, maybe anything sort of good to the order or anything else that folks would like to chime in with? I know we're pushing noon here. I see Tammy's hand. I'm, I'm just wondering, our meeting for the 18th is, is canceled. Is that right, Teresa? What's the plan from here? Um, I think so. I have a meeting with the co-chairs on Tuesday morning. I mean, as of now, as far as legislation, yeah, you've completed your work unless there are amendments or brand new bills that pop up. But yeah, you, you should, you, you'll see something one way or another by yeah, late morning or Tuesday. Great. So any, any other business, any other comments? Everyone excited for the uh, very nice weather and uh, practically tropical, what, 50-something 50, 50 degrees, I think, out, out the window. <laughs> All right, well, I think we can we can adjourn and let, let everybody get to lunch, unless there's an objection to that. None. Thank you very much, Scott. Good meeting. Great. 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 Great.